Renata Bernardi, I'm your host, and this podcast is dedicated to job hunters and career enthusiasts. Those of you who are in between jobs, looking to advance your career in the future, uh, looking for tips and advice on how to job interview, apply for jobs, write your resumes, and have the best possible career that you can have, especially in these times of COVID-19, how to prepare for jobs of the future has become become more and more relevant. So I hope you enjoy this episode and previous episodes as well. So have a look through our archives and see if there's anything there that might be of benefit to you as you start planning your next steps. And if you want to always be in the know and be following us in the future, click the following button wherever you found us. This podcast, whenever we are able to film it, it's available on YouTube. Otherwise, it is always available on iTunes, Spotify, and of course, always available on my website. So the links to all of those um, social channels will be on the episode show notes below. So click on the episode show notes and find us everywhere. Um, so today we have a great guest. It's my friend, Lynn Casali. Lynn and I have met each other uh, four years ago. Um, and since then, um, I've always been very much of an admirer of her work. She's a speaker, a great speaker, a trainer, an author, and a coach and a consultant. Lynn helps teams and individuals be more agile, be better at communicating. She uses a lot of visual tools and trains people on how to use visual techniques to send messages, to um, help people manage projects more efficiently. And recently she has published her latest book, Ish. Ish is the problem with our pursuit for perfection and the life-changing practice of good enough. I adore this book. I have mentioned this book a couple of times. I think it's the perfect book for job hunters and people that are stuck and possibly procrastinating in their career advancements, thinking that they need a little bit of this and a little bit of that before they go ahead and apply for that job or ask for that promotion. It could be that you are a perfectionist and uh, reading this book might unstuck you. And we are going to go through this very casual. You can see that Lynn and I forgot that this was a podcast interview and we very casually go through um, some of the topics of the book that she covers in the book that I was very um, interested in uh, unpacking with her. And um, so this is a very casual conversation. I'm glad that we captured it in video so that you can have that um, sort of look at our body language and, and, and um, see that as well. But of course, if you're listening to it in audio, you're not going to miss much. I hope you enjoy the chat and look for the episode show notes for the time snaps of every bit of the conversation. So if you want to skip ahead and go straight to something specific. So for example, um, there will be times when we speak about the three types of perfectionists. There will be times when we speak about perfectionism and job hunting. There will be times when we talk about jo how job hunters can prepare themselves to go into um, job interviews. You know, all of the opportunities where perfectionism can get in the way we really try to touch on this interview and there are little time snaps that you can go straight to that if you want to. But if I were you, I would just go through the whole thing. It's about 30 minutes long. I hope you enjoy this interview and I really do hope to get um, Lynn again in the future to talk about being agile and um, yeah, she's a great speaker and somebody that I hope will become a regular in this podcast. Talk to you soon. Bye. Lynn, thank you so much for joining us for this podcast today. 
Tell us a little bit about your career in the corporate sector before you started doing your own thing. Yes, sure. It's great to be speaking with you and your listeners. My corporate career was around the a broader topic of communications. So I worked in uh, public relations, community relations. Uh, I seemed to have comms in my job role. And I worked through a number of positions, getting kind of better and higher in the organisation chart as I went. And then I ended up in a senior uh, executive director role. So I, I kind of climbed, 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 and then hit the top. You know, you get the company yeah. car and the credit card and you think you've made it. And then you go, why am I not feeling fulfilled? Yes. <laughs> So those roles, when I look back on them now, I just think, oh, they were the most wonderful jobs. Like mm -hmm. they, I worked in public health, I worked in the arts and media, I worked in education and training, I worked in state and local government, and most of my reflections on that time were, wow, look at all the stuff I did and mm -hmm. how well organisations support their employees. Because mm. it's quite different than when you're working on your own. So, it is, it yeah. is. And during that time, like the book you wrote, I don't know if you know this, I've mentioned it in two or three podcast oh, episodes already. Yeah, yeah. Because it's, I think it's such an important book for people that are, are professionals to read, yes. especially people that are in between jobs. Yes. And we can unpack that a little bit more as we go. But do you remember in your experiences in the corporate world, the need to be perfect, the, uh, that, the perfection as being something that was always in the back of your mind or mm. something that impacted the way that you did your work? Yes, I certainly remember it. Maybe not perfect for everything, but there would be certain things like in communications and PR, I was responsible for producing the annual report mm -hmm. of each of those organisations. And so to try and make sure you've got the figures correct in the back yeah. and the right captions and, you know, spelling mistakes. And I remember one of the first reports I produced and it came back from the printer and the CEO picked it up and he looked at it. And like magic, you know, he's flicking it open and he finds a spelling mistake and points at it. I also remember he touched the cover and, and the cover didn't have a sheen on it. And so his fingerprints were on there. It was like oh. I, I was just having these demonstrations of not good enough, not good enough, not good enough. Yeah. And But now I look at them and go, no, I was learning stuff. I, I, there's no way I could have done all of that perfectly no. I had to make a few hiccups so that I could learn that next skill or that next technique I feel that your book came about at an era where we're starting to understand that yeah. perfection shouldn't be a goal yeah but even in theory when we said that maybe 10 years ago we just didn't know what it meant because our bosses were asking for it. Our KPIs and our key deliverables like annual reports, such a good example. I was thinking about it when I, I was asking you the question. I used to have a boss that was unapologetic about perfection and, and in that governance space, you know, because the document is finite, mm. if you're not actually doing it yourself, if you're, you know, a level or two up, mm your understanding is that it is just a, a document. So you need to get it perfect. But yes. as you and I know, because we've done it, <laughs> it's very hard to actually get it absolutely perfect. Yeah. 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 And I guess that word perfect is impossible because mm -hmm. there will be an error or there will be something as time changes, the document is now out of date. So it's imperfect. Yeah. But we shouldn't confuse perfect with going for accurate or complete. So I think this blanket label of perfect is too much pressure for us. Yes. Um, whereas if we say we're going for accuracy, you know, we need 100% accuracy or is this the complete information for this project? Those are very good replacements, I mm -hmm. think, because mm -hmm. people want to understand what does it mean now yeah. in 2020 yes. that we can strive for something else. So you changing the goals is really mm -hmm. important. So mm -hmm. people still have um, aims and targets that they need to yeah to. Okay. I think this is one of the key things is that perfection is this undefined or ill-defined 
end goal. And the sooner we can define elements of that so we know what we're going for, the more likely we are to hit those. Correct. During your work experience and and even writing the book, looking back as you have done, do you remember the triggers during applying for jobs or going for job interviews? Because I think that that's, again, another time in people's careers that perfection tends to play in our heads and and be quite an impediment. Yeah. So what would you, you know, what, tell us a bit about your story, you know, dealing with it. Mm. How would you advise people to deal with it now Mm, I think there's that a couple of elements there's the resume or cv and trying to make it a perfect match to the job Mm -hmm. the information that you've got the job description or the advertisement and so you can spend too long doing that Mm -hmm. because I think you need to respond in a timely manner now if you're Mm -hmm. spending too long putting your cv or resume together I know I certainly missed opportunities because I'd I'd spent days and days and days when as I should have just got it in there as quickly as I you know as quickly as I could and then there's the interview and thinking how do I prepare for every possible question they can ask me Mm. and this is perfectionism right we can't prepare for every question Mm. but we can prepare some responses I, I learned that in PR in media training, right? I can't Mm. respond to every or can't prepare for every question the media might ask me, but I can have some general responses under some categories. And so that stops me overworking, overthinking, ruminating, beating myself up and trying to be perfect. I love what you're saying. I actually thought you were going to start talking about improv because you mentioned it in the book. And I remember starting reading your book and I'm like, oh, you know, I've actually really struggled with improv, improvisation. When I was younger, I did piano lessons during many Mm -hmm. years, very sort of classical, traditional style. And then unfortunately, my wonderful piano teacher passed away. She had cancer and it was actually, you know, quite sad and I was very young. And I decided, I told my mom, okay, I want a completely different style now mm-hmm. since, you know, you know, I'm not going to have this wonderful teacher that I adored. I want to do improv. Mm. God, that was the mistake. <laughs> it was a, it's a, from moving from playing bar and bar talk and doing sort of very traditional oh, yeah. piano, I went into like jazzy improv (laughs) style and it did not last like six months. I struggled with it. So when you were talking about learning improvisation, I was so interested to actually learn more from the book. (laughs) There's another book idea for you because it's also an art and a technique, Mm. right? Yeah. And I think it lends itself really well for networking job interviews and thinking on the spot and not wasting opportunity like you said Mm. not wasting Mm. time and just improvising i from that little bit that i read in your book it has Mm. changed the way i do career coaching a little bit i've been telling people you don't have time to do the perfect resume for this job application you're calling me on a friday you're telling me the job application ends today if you want this job, you have to improvise. What mm-hmm. can you do? Right? Mm-hmm. So um, I want you to tell us a little bit more about how that learning about improv changed the way that your career progressed and how mm-hmm. you went about doing things differently. Yeah. So I'd been working in my own business for a few years and I'd observed, I'd worked with an agile software development team and I was seeing how they were putting out uh very early versions of their apps, you know, it was incomplete, yet they were still launching it out to the public for them to test it. So this was happening during the day. I was working with this team thinking, gee, aren't they brave and courageous to put this out? And then I'd been watching improv. Usually we see it's comedy, but often there's very deep emotional, you know, long form plays on stage with uh, improvisers making up the script. And so I went along to, you know, theatre sports or one of the other performance sort of festivals and the local group to me, Impro Melbourne, were promoting some of their courses. And I thought, I'm going to do that. That looks like fun. And it is fun, but it's also incredibly developing because it helps you build 
your spontaneity muscle. That was the, one of the first things we did was learn about spontaneity because we're kind of all control freaks. We're trying to hold on to things so tightly and predict things and control the ending. Yeah. And for me, what that means is we're not actually trusting ourselves. Like we do have incredible experience. We need to trust that we can handle what comes up and most of us don't trust mm. that and so improv I think really helps you build that trust in yourself and trust in others that even if they do something unexpected you will still be able to handle it mm. and it it really is based on some wonderful principles and being used a lot more in business today uh, so there's some great reading on the topic of improv business improv you know, improvisational wisdom. There's a heap of books if you're interested in. Oh in, yes, in let's more. add the links to the episode show notes. Then I am, I'm interested. So yeah, yeah. Me, I I want you to tell me um, sure. which books they are, and we'll have the links there. Yeah. So you wrote this book in a way as well, mm. where you kept you you used improv in writing the book and you used the future editions to adjust and make corrections to the book. (laughs) I'm sure everybody else did it previously, but they just didn't highlight it. Yeah. Is that right? So is this a practice that other writers have used, but they just didn't tell other people that they were fixing little issues and you, you went and said, okay, this is all about not being perfect. I might as well highlight the fact that I'm, Yeah, possibly. There's one platform called Lean Pub, which some people, again, in this lean and agile world will start writing their book Uh and they put their very early thoughts up there and get feedback from people. And so that helps kind of steer or guide them in the development. I didn't quite do it like that. I worked on an initial document, shared it with some people, got their feedback, you know, worked on the next edition. And I think by the time I was up to the third iteration not edition third uh, iteration I put that up for sale on my website and a bunch of people bought it okay and it was I've got I've still got pile of them here it was crap right it was crappy it was (laughs) lots of my thinking not particularly well organized and yeah unfortunately a couple of people reviewed it like it was a you know (laughs) The final thing. Oh, really? Saying, oh, it's repetitive. And I'm thinking, of course it's repetitive. It hasn't been edited yet, you know. So then I did the fourth version and then the fifth version is the one that's out there and that's been edited structurally. It's been copy edited. It's been reduced in size. Like I've taken out so much and reorganised it. So it's a much better version. I wonder which version I have because I have one from early last year. Yeah, that will be, uh, if the cover, it feels quite soft and velvety. I love the cover. Then that's, that, that's the current version. Oh, yeah. good. Okay. Because yeah. uh, I told my husband, touch this. Yeah. It feels so good. <laughs> it feels nice. Oh, nice. <laughs> but the reason why I, I wanted you to go deeper into that and explain it, because the listeners for this podcast can use this as an example of how you should treat your resume, folks. Mm. Listen to me. I've been telling you for a while. (laughs) You can send out your resume, even if it's not your, you know, the one that is complete and accurate. You want it to be accurate in as much as it includes the accurate employment details that you had. But if you are forever procrastinating sending it out, you will you won't ever send it out. That's and right. one of the mistakes that people, the beliefs that people have is that once they send it out, it will be filed and recorded as is, and people will have that version forever and ever, hmm. which is not the case. I can okay. assure you that headhunters, recruiters, hiring managers would really appreciate you coming back to them a month from now and saying, I have a, I have done work on my resume and I have a newer version. Yeah. And I've attached it to this email yeah. for you. And they will update their records. Yes. I know this yes. for a fact. So you shouldn't feel like because you don't have the perfect resume, yeah. Yeah. you shouldn't be applying or sending it out. Yeah. Yeah. Hello there. Sorry to interrupt. I thought I should remind you to 
subscribe to the newsletter. So if you haven't done that yet, let me tell you, it's great value. I will send you a newsletter every week with the new episode of the Job Hunting Podcast, plus a whole bunch of interesting articles and any tools and resources that I put together for free for my subscribers and also the news and the links to the live coaching that I do every week on Facebook. So why don't you do that? There is a link to it in the episode show notes. Bye. You are sending it out. Yeah. So yeah. true. Yeah. The yeah. version that is out there may not be the final version. That's why we use a thing in business called version control, mm-hmm. right, is to say what edition of this document am I reading? Mm. So put a, put a date in the footer. You know, you could say resume number six, July 2020. Now I know that's the version that that person's looking at. Yeah. Yeah. So we know when was it current and then you can send the next one and go, here's my, you know, August 2020 version of my resume, which has been updated with, you know, a new certification or a new contract role I had or a new client. That's great. So, you know, and I've been asking you questions and talking about it. And every now and then I make a mistake to use the word you, the perfect resume. And I find that in the recruitment and selection world, mm. that world, that word is still thrown around a lot. Yeah, I could imagine. Yeah. yeah. And it's not a thought leadership that has permeated that environment. Mm-hmm. No. And if you are talking to recruiters or if you're going to, if you're a younger member of the audience who is still at uni, a graduate, you know, you might go to a graduate event where you would have an organization speaking with the HR talent person there. And they may use, they may say something like, you have to be very careful when you're sending out your resume. Don't make any spelling mistakes. Mm. You know, they say that a lot. Yes. And then it makes you anxious and makes yeah, you strive cool. for per- perfection. So how do you deal with that? And people that are at work, you know, how do you deal with the, the boss who is a perfectionist? Mm-hmm. And mm. you mentioned that in the book, but I, I'd love you to tell the listeners as well. What tips do you have for people that work with perfectionists Mm -hmm. or work with environments that still use that word as well? And that there's a lot of expectations. Yeah. And, and I see the reason why perfectionism is a problem like this is, Mm. and the research over the last 20 years showed it, that perfectionism is on the increase. Mm. So us behaving in this way isn't working because we keep getting worse at it. So what we see with someone who, say, a boss or leader who's a perfectionist, that is a particular type of perfectionism. It's where they hold very high standards for other people. So there's three main types of perfectionism, and that's what I would, in, from the research, I would call type three. The other two types, the first one is where we have very high standards for ourselves. Mm. So that might be where I can't send that resume yet because it's not perfect. You know, I couldn't send it. Then the second type is societal or society's perceptions, what we think is society's perceptions. Okay. So there could be that feeling of, I couldn't send this because the recruiter wouldn't accept it. Yes. Hear how that's different to, I have high standards for me. Mm, maybe the recruiter wouldn't accept it. You get the job and then the boss is the third type, which is they have high standards for you. So if you find yourself in that third type what we need to do is kind of nail or pin down the standard that this person's asking for usually we hear it as something is due next tuesday and so we work flat out between now and next tuesday to get it done and the only standard we have is a deadline of time But the smart thing to do is to ask, and I will write it down in front of someone. I'll say, so it's due next Tuesday. Can you tell me a bit more about what you're expecting? Is it one or two pages? Do you need, you know, how many words is this? Are you needing images with it? So I'll ask some more, I guess, qualifying questions, trying to get them to define more of what the standard is that they're expecting, not just the deadline. Mm -hmm. Would you try to negotiate or build some empathy around deadlines that might be unachievable? Oh, totally. Yeah. Yeah. If that's, 
Like if a deadline's not achievable but we only know it's not achievable if we know what the standard is we're going for right absolutely you're right so if yeah, someone says, yeah. says yeah says it's due next tuesday and you think there's no way i could do that how do you know yeah. that your your perception of what needs to be done could be quite different to what that person needs and i saw a great example recently a participant in one of my workshops had worked really hard for their manager for this day at the workshop put together all of this data, all of this information for a presentation. And she she looked at it all and she went, oh, oh, yeah, that's a bit of overkill. All I really needed were those three top, that top line data. That's yeah. all. And yeah. and they've gone, oh, no, <laughs> I worked night and day on that. Yes, yes, yes. Oh, so many times I've been there and done that, you know. Yeah. You try to over-deliver yeah. when, in fact, that's not needed at all. It's no. not needed. So until we might, we might need to be brave enough to mm-hmm. ask the question, but it's like a... You know, it's like someone coming in and building a fence in, in your, for your front, you know, the front of your house. Yeah. You don't just say, build me a fence. And then they build this incredible fence and you go, well, actually, no, that's not the fence I was wanting. Mm. We have a brief, right? We say, I want a fence. It needs to be wood or I'd like some bricks, like some wrought iron in there. Uh-huh. <laughs> we have a brief and therefore that person delivering on that brief knows what it is. Yeah. And I think too often we work to no brief. The brief is imaginary in our mind. Absolutely. You're absolutely right. And I think that in this environment that I'm in, where I'm helping people get jobs as a career coach, the challenge that I have is that I am asking my clients to develop their personal briefs before they go out and look at sick.com and find other people's briefs for them. Yeah. And I think that the whole recruitment and selection world is structured in a way to take away your, the individual's power and control. Yeah. Yeah. And to make them feel anxious and that need for perfection in the way that they present themselves is Mm the onus is all on them Mm. the organization can be as imperfect as we know they are you know we see it in the news but we still want to work there anyway and they put they put these beautifully done expensive marketing material out in the world on their beautiful websites and the position descriptions are a mile long Mm. and it makes you feel very uncomfortable because you can't meet all of the criteria Yeah. yeah so this is the reason why I've mentioned your book so much, you mm-hmm. see, and it makes me very conflicted because this is the reality of what mm-hmm. my clients have to go through, what my mm-hmm. listeners have to go through. And here I am pushing back against that and trying to give them more power mm-hmm. and trying to give them more of a voice mm-hmm. and to do that, that they need to put that brief aside for a bit and build their own brief. Yes. So that they walk into the recruitment and selection, uh, literally, or via email, whichever way it is, but they walk with more confidence Yes. Yeah, in their abilities and what they want and how they want to negotiate mm-hmm. the, the final salary package mm-hmm. and all of that. But it's structurally very unfair in this yeah. space that I operate yeah. in. Yeah. And I don't know if you have any thoughts about that in terms of how to deal with, I mean, you mentioned the society, your idea that the society needs the, the perfectionism and, and you can't meet that. So it's mm. basically around that sphere. And what would you add to that in terms of how we can better build the armor around the candidates going through selection and and Mm. recruitment processes and how to give them more oomph, more confidence for them to go through this process. Yeah, so the idea of being a a good fit is what I go for, is that, you know, that I'm 80% of the way there Mm. or even less, but it's enough, uh, enough of a match Mm -hmm. uh, or that I have enough of the characteristics or capabilities or experience that they need not every single thing. I'm not a recruiter, but I've certainly been, you know, 
a, a job hunter in yeah. in the past and and I guess the recruiter in, as a, as an employee but the idea of perfectionism is is that it doesn't exist and mm. so all all the effort or the overthinking that we do all of the extra hours working on things is often not bringing us a reward mm. and the the research around that was quite shocking is that we think it is working or it makes us feel better about the information, but it doesn't actually change the quality of the information we've produced. Mm. And we know this from the economic law, right? The law of diminishing returns that yes. at a certain point, our effort does not return equal to the investment of time we've put in. It does for a certain point, And then there's yes. that tipping point where it's just a waste. Absolutely. 80 20 principle, right? The Pareto principle 20% focus on the most important stuff to get that incredible return rather than faffing about on the 80% that's only going to deliver you 20% return. And with that in mind, how would you structure your day? as a job hunter, if you were a job hunter, and it's very similar to what you and me do in terms of b developing business, right? Yes. So yes. how would you structure your day to make it the more effective and efficient possible and not impact your well-being in that sense? Because mm -hmm. that part of your book was really important to me. I remember <laughs> reading it when I was actually putting too much effort on things yeah. and, and things started going wrong for me. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And that's what I sometimes see happening to candidates. So yeah. I'm, I'm, you know, the candidates listening to this podcast may have missed this opportunity, but at the moment, cause it's not going live uh, until next month, but at mm. the moment I'm doing free consultations. Mm -hmm. so I'm, I'm talking to a lot of people and they all come to me with, I'm putting so many resumes out there or I've been to so many interviews and nothing is converting. I'm not getting, you know, yeah. uh, and I, I can relate to that part of your book where you say, it doesn't matter if you put that much effort, you're not going, not only you're not going to get more returns, you're going to get worse. Worse. Yeah. That, it that takes really off. Yeah. So I wanted to see if you had any ideas of how to structure your day your mm. routine to make the most out of it, maybe based on research that you did for the book or you did for yourself? Yeah, well, a key is to work at the times that work for you. Mm. So if you're, uh, I know there's lots of data around whether people are night owls or early morning people, but I found that getting into activity early in the day is important. So I make sure I'm I'm either learning or reading something or writing something, building curation of my own skill rather than scrolling through social media or you know starting to head on a downer so I've got to do something that makes me feel good mm. so that I'm in a good state of mind and then I think another thing is where you mentioned you know you're putting all these resumes out there and nothing's happening again from the software development field where I did some work and still do is they run experiments so if you think about putting your resume out there as an experiment and then you're going to get some data back from that and then you need to tweak or adjust depending on that response. Now, if you've put heaps of resumes out there and you've got no response, that's data, right? It's saying you need to change something. Yes. Whereas what if you put a few out there, you've got a couple of responses, you can make some tweaks or adjustments and this is the idea of iterative improvement or iterative development over time rather than sweating away for days and weeks putting it out and going well that's my perfect resume I don't need to change it anymore yeah. is that's a very fixed way of thinking and a fixed way of working if we put our resume out there going right this is a bit of an experiment I'm going to see what does the market think of this what's the market looking for okay I need to dial up these skills I have you know, quieten down this experience mm. and and test, keep testing and iterating your, not only your resume, but also your responses. Yeah. How you show up, you know, what you wear, what yeah. you say. If you can keep changing and iterating that and finding where is the sweet spot that works, that's me, you know, feels yeah. good for me and it works out to be a match for that yeah. client, now we're learning and adjusting and adapting. 
And listeners, if you are listening and thinking, oh, Lynn, nobody gets back to me anymore. That's why it's good to have a coach or at least a mentor, right? Yes. And let me tell you, Lynn, they're right because the market is so uh, busy at the moment yeah. that yeah. the recruiters sometimes never get back to you, yeah. especially in Australia. So if people are overseas and they move to Australia, they usually tell me, you know, Australia, nobody gets Not back to you. Uh, you know, and they may have been in other countries where even New Zealand, you know, people that have moved here from New Zealand say that New Zealand headhunters and recruiters are lovely. They, I think that by law, maybe they may. They yeah, do. maybe. Yeah. Maybe. Uh, but if you have somebody like me or the job hunting podcast private group on Facebook, you can say, this is what they told me on the phone. What yeah. do you think it means? Yeah, yeah. You know, and that's why that private group is so good because it's a safe environment and you can unpack that, those unwritten feedbacks. Yes. Or, yeah. You know, what does it mean that I didn't hear anything? And yeah. Well, it, yeah. it could have meant one of these three things. So remember that, guys. So what Lynn is saying is absolutely <laughs> correct. You can still get feedback even if you don't get feedback. Yeah, yeah. So it's just are, an experiment. That's yes, think yeah. Of it. But each thing I'm doing is just another experiment or a hypothesis that I have. Mm -hmm. uh, and let's see what I hear about that and what I can learn about that. I have unpacked things even with like two liners hmm. and emails that were sent to clients yeah. of mine. Yeah. Even like they said, oh, I called them and this is what they said. Just very briefly, they only said this to me. What do you think it means? And I said, I know exactly what it means. Yeah. It means blah, blah, blah. So you need to have somebody that have been just there are just a few years ahead of you yeah right? yeah that's all yeah. you need you know somebody that has done that been there and they will give you feedback so yes. either yeah. work with somebody like me or some some other coach that you have uh, that you trust or go to the private group you know because that's free mm. and ask people and you know that we have another podcaster there chris who does a career podcast in the u.s and he's also, you know, I told him, if I'm not around, you just answer, you know, yeah. like, you know, let's yeah. help each other. Yeah. yeah, that's right. Lynn, it has been so good to talk to you. Now, if people want to know more about you, mm -hmm. want to read your book or do one of the wonderful um, training develop things that you do, mm -hmm. where they, can they find you? Tell us. Yeah, go straight to my website, mm -hmm. lindsayley.com. And I'm on social media under those as well. I'd love to connect on LinkedIn, Instagram sharing i share posts most days on linkedin which are getting a great following so okay. that's about being you know unique in yourself is is working out what your positioning or what your ideas are and and sharing those with the world yeah and then books where you normally get your books but yeah come to linkazali.com and there's plenty of blogs history lots of other resources available. lots of other books as well yeah. Yeah. Yes. Okay. All right. I'll put those links in the episode show notes and also in the um, Facebook group and Facebook page. So follow us and you shall find Lynn Kazali. Thank you so much. Lynn. Thank you. Thank you. Rena. Okay. I hope you enjoyed the interview with Lynn. Like I said, so many great, interesting tips and advice from um, the Pareto principle, the idea that if you put too much effort into something, it might actually be negatively affect uh, your chances of success and um, not worrying too much about being perfect, but um, focusing instead on accuracy and being complete in your application as much as possible. So having that more achievable goal, I think is a really important one for job seekers. So I hope you enjoyed it. Like I said, don't forget to follow this podcast um, here on YouTube or iTunes or Spotify. And most importantly, subscribe to the newsletter and I'll send it to you weekly. <laughs>